you have you have written that uh, authentic conservatism has been abandoned by the Republican Party. Do I get that right? In the post-Reagan period of time, uh, you've had a combination of what I call the uh, corporate liberal pragmatists or the Machiavellian pragmatists like Karl Rove masquerading as conservatives and the neoconservatives uh, who uh, <clears throat> who are not real conservatives, uh, uh, but are former liberal Democrats who believe in the Wilsonian idea that you can use U.S. military force to uh, impose democracy throughout the world and in the in the Middle East in particular. Yeah, it's not unique to Woodrow Wilson, by the way. No, <laughs> so, no, as you well know. No, uh, and, and nor not. did he originate that. Uh, I mean, go back and look at Lincoln's criticisms of Polk in the Mexican American War. You know, making the world safe for democracy is though yeah. we can impose our values everywhere in the world. And, and quite frankly, you know, I was in Vietnam when you had the McNamara civilian whiz kids who uh, had high IQs but were brilliantly wrong. Yep. And uh, same with Paul Wolfowitz and the architects of uh, the war in Iraq, uh, my age, but none of them uh, I can remember that served in Vietnam or even in the military. So yeah. they don't understand the law of unintended consequences when you send young uh, soldiers off to war. All right, it's why we call them chicken hawks, and it's why Arnold Toynbee uh, famously noted that when the generation that fought the last great war dies, then the next great war is inevitable because, the, the, because that generation doesn't remember how, how horrible war really is. Well, it's uh, you know we I, I saw I saw the consequences of a flawed strategy in Vietnam, and I was opposed to I was all for what we did in Afghanistan, as I talk about in the book after nine eleven. But what's the reason? Uh, what's our mission for being there ten years later? Is it to prop up the Karzai regime? And and I was opposed to the preemptive war. Uh, in Iraq, uh, uh, based on faulty intelligence, I mean, whoever put Douglas Fife as the number three guy at the Department of Defense running a separate intelligence uh, unit, it, it, it's totally bewildering yeah. uh, to me. And, I mean, uh, guess what? Uh, now you got a guy like Sadr, who's one of the key political figures there, who's a Shiite fundamentalist and an anti-American cleric with close ties to the mullahs in Iran. So right. who are opening not, banks in both countries, by the way. Well, and things have not worked out uh, the way the neoconservatives told us. Uh, but right. uh, look at your neoliberals, whether it's uh, uh, the Hillary Clinton, Samantha Powers in Libya, or uh, back in the Balkans, getting in the middle of that conflict in the Clinton administration. So it's right. the same... I. So, Tom, let me, let, we're talking with Tom Pauk and right. the, uh, with a long CV. I won't repeat the whole thing be, uh, before uh, again, but you've, you, uh, White House counsel under Reagan, uh, a, a solid, solid Republican and conservative credentials, and the author of the mo most recent book, Bringing America Home. Um, you have criticisms of your party. I have criticisms of the Democratic Party. We can each criticize each other's parties right. all day long. But isn't there a much larger issue here that perhaps we can agree on? And that is that to the extent that both parties, uh, the Republican Party during the Bush administration with the neocons you were pointing out, the Democrat, the Democratic Party with, uh, you know, a variety of policies from endorsing free trade to endorsing wars as well, that they have come under the influence of enormous money. Oh, and, uh, yeah, I say it in my book. I mean, you've got, uh, you've got a tax system that, uh, uh, you know, that rewards debt and punitively taxes uh, employment savings and uh, capital investment, which are the engines of economic growth. It works great for the Wall Street financial engineers and the private equity moguls, but it's lousy for job creation here in the U.S. You and I might have a different solution to it, but I think there's a, I think there's a real common ground on both economic issues and in foreign policy policy issues with what I would call the uh, Goldwater Reagan conservatives and, and, and the old liberals. We're not mm. that far apart. On cultural yeah. issues, there's a real divide. But but I think there's an opportunity to bring the country together. I mean, we're, we're, we're killing our manufacturing base. I mean, I talk in the book. We've lost one-third of our U.S. manufacturing jobs over right. the last If decade. we simply went back to the trade policies that Eisenhower had, where we had an average tariff of 31% on imported goods, we supported R&D, and we supported uh, domestic industries, and we enforced the Sherman Antitrust Act, which Reagan stopped in 82, and, and therefore it, there, were, there were not huge barriers uh, to entry for you know, people and companies who wanted to get into, into new businesses. 
uh, you know, we wouldn't have every mall in America looking identical. Well, we would... Reagan was a little tougher on the trade issue. I mean, his his trade advisor is Clyde Pretzerwis. If you've ever read any of I know Clyde, Clyde's yeah. uh, works, yeah. uh, he's 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 no uh, he's no free trader at all. Of this uh, free trade nonsense, and yeah. I I just have a different approach. I mean, I favor. Uh, replacing the uh, existing uh, the existing corporate tax structure with a, a border adjusted business consumption tax, so all sure. goods and services coming into the U.S. would have to pay an eight percent tax. It raises just as much revenue, but then all of a sudden you're leveling the playing field with our trading competitors. Well, it's a great start. I mean, we can we can again we can right. debate about how how to accomplish yeah, but, this, but, but let the, me let me go to the very the biggest possible picture here in the in the three minutes we have left, Tom. Right. Um, in at, at the end of the Civil War. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed to free the slaves. The 14th Amendment says no person shall be denied equal rights under the law. Now, historically, corporations, churches, and governments were referred to as artificial persons, and human beings were referred to as natural persons. Uh, Two decades later, that was ratified in 1868. In 1886, the Supreme Court, or the clerk of the Supreme Court, wrote a head note to a decision, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, saying that because the word natural did not precede the word person, that when they freed the slaves, they also meant to free the corporations. And the corporations were persons, too. And that leads us right to Citizens United in 2010, and the two decisions, the two major decisions that led up to it, Buckley versus Vallejo in the 70s and in the 80s, First National Bank of, uh, uh, versus Bilotti, uh, Boston versus Bilotti, which said that money is speech and the corporations are persons. And, and th- what this has brought about is the massive corruption of our political processes. Would you agree with me to support something like a move to amend the Constitution to say that speech is something only human beings can do and that money is not speech and that corporations are not persons? Well, I, you know, you're, you're hitting me with something I haven't thought about in great depth. I would favor uh, the idea of uh, public uh, financing of, uh, of uh, TV ads for candidates and how you'd structure that. I but the Supreme know, Court just shot that down in Arizona. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, just te- I'm just telling you my... I'm, I'm, right. I'm simply saying right. that philosophically I am concerned with the power of big money on both sides of the aisle, yep, whether it's the George Soros or some of the guys you complain about yep. on, on, on the right. I, I, uh, it is too... It is a corrupting process, and and uh, look, I started out as a Goldwater conservative running against the Rockefeller Wall Street crowd. Ronald Reagan, for whatever you may say about him, he was opposed by the Wall Street crowd. And in the post-Reagan period, uh, the, the big uh, money guys uh, control us. But by the by the way, Robert Rubin was Secretary of Treasury in the... Oh, Clinton the big money guys have taken over the institutional parts yeah. of both parties. They, they have, and it's very frustrating. And uh, and I'm I'm you know sick of it, and I don't know. I mean, you know, the, if they're too big to fail, they're too big. The bailout yep. of the it began in the Clinton administration, and continued in the Bush administration to a greater degree with Paulson. This stuff has got to stop. It's a it, it. And you're right. Both parties are guilty because whoever gets in. Uh, the financial institutions wind up driving the train on these kind of well, and, and this is lar- policy decisions. Yeah, and this is largely because we have a system established by the Supreme Court, never established by any Congress or president, that says that you know money basically decides everything. Tom Pawkin, it's a fascinating conversation. Um, thank you for coming on the program today. Thanks for having me again, Tom. Tom Pawkin, P-A-U-K-E-N dot com is his website.